Hello, everybody. Leo Laporte here for a very special hands-on Mac. Normally, I give you tips. Today, we're going to talk about something huge coming to the Macintosh. Stay tuned. Hands-on Mac comes to you from Twit's LastPass Studios. You're focused on security, but are your employees LastPass can ensure they are by making access and authentication seamless. Whether they're working in the office or remotely, visit LastPass.com slash Twit to learn more. This is Twit. This episode of Hands on Mac is brought to you by LastPass. Visit LastPass.com slash Twit. Hello, everybody. Leo Laporte here. Time for Hands on Mac. Happy 3rd of July. Hope you have a great Independence Day weekend. And today we're going to talk about, uh, it's going to be a little bit different. Usually I give you tips. There will be a tip in this episode. The tip is whether or not to buy a Mac in the next few months. And the reason is, of course, the big announcements Apple made this week at the Worldwide Developers Conference. I guess it was last week as we're talking. Uh, wow. Wow. We knew it was coming, but I think Apple really knocked it out of the park with their announcement that they were going to move away from Intel and make future Macs with Apple-designed silicon. I want to talk a little bit about what that means, especially to you as a Mac user, and why I am really excited about it. Macintosh is almost 50 years old. It started in 1984. I bought my first Mac uh, about, I think, two months after it came out. In uh, I think April of nineteen of nineteen eighty four. Wow, such a long time! Almost fifty years ago, uh, it was a precious thing, and it was running on a chip from Motorola called the sixty eight thousand. Uh, of course, you know I'm a hobbyist programmer. I like to write software. I started immediately to delve into the Macintosh, and one of the things that was unique about Mac in those days, I remember nineteen eighty four. Uh, before Windows came out, we were still using, you know, command line based computers, was how much of the Mac's heart and soul was built into it in what they called the read only memory or ROM. Apple's ROMs had so many routines, routines for drawing windows and, and menus, for making sounds. Everything you needed to do as a programmer was there in the ROMs. And that was a pretty amazing thing for Apple to do. It, it gave them a real benefit because it meant that software design for the Macintosh kind of all worked the same way. So a user could learn one program, MacWrite, their word processing program, and pretty quickly pick up any other program. The menus were similar, the structure was the same, the ideas were the same. This was really important because the Macintosh operating system, the graphic user interface was really a, a landmark. And so people were very unfamiliar with even using a mouse, remember. So it was a big deal. And Apple, I think, solved this problem very elegantly. In those days, when you were writing software for the Macintosh, you were writing for a 68,000 processor from Motorola, probably in Pascal. That was the language they preferred in those days. Uh, maybe an assembler. I did both. And almost always using code that was built into those ROMs. As years went by, the Macintosh lived on as a brand, but the style, the feeling, the way it worked changed dramatically. Although I think its, it's heart and soul was always computers for the rest of us, computers that were easy to use, computers that were powerful. The Mac, even in 1984, was the most powerful computer that I'd ever used. Uh, and they've kept that alive, traditional alive, through a number of transitions. They abandoned the Motorola chips for power PC chips uh, a few years later. And then very famously, about 15 years ago, they abandoned the power PC chips for Intel chips. Those are big transitions for computing systems to go through. In fact, if you look at their competitors, Windows and Linux, for the most part, they've run on what we call the x86 architecture, the Intel architecture, since the beginning. Since DOS, they've run on x86. Even AMD, when they made chips, decided, well, we're going to make them x86 compatible. So Apple saying, no more x86, no more Intel, we're going to make our own chips, is a big shift. You might have heard these chips called ARM chips, and that's not strictly true. ARM is a company that designs chips, designs specifications. Apple has a license 
they call it the ARM architecture license, to take ARM's technology and design their own chips. And they do. And so the chips Apple designs are compatible with other ARM manufacturers' chips like Qualcomm and so, uh, the Exynos from Samsung. But they aren't the same by any means. They're very much their own beast. Compatible is good, though, because it means that ARM software, uh, software written for one ARM chip will, with modif minor modifications, work okay on, on another ARM chip. So it is important, this ARM compatibility. But note, as Apple doesn't mention ARM very much, really, they are Apple Silicon. Apple has purchased uh, some years ago a silicon uh, chip manufacturer, PA Semi. They've hired many, many engineers. They have, as best we can figure out, at least 1,000 chip designers, 1,000 chip designers working for them right now. In every respect, Apple is an equal to Intel. And in fact, I think that's one of the changes that's happened is that Apple feels like they can do better than Intel. Intel's been lagging a little bit in the last five years, and I think Apple's felt a little bit held back by the fact that they were using Intel chips. Of course, they make their own chips for the iPhone and for the iPad, and that's important, too. They have a lot of experience doing that now, more than 10 years, and everybody agrees the processors that go in the iPhone and the iPad are best in class. They're the best mobile processors made. They beat the Qualcomm chips. They beat the Samsung chips. They beat everybody. Uh, and in fact, when I got the latest iPad Pro, actually the last two iPad Pros, it's been pretty amazing to see that A12 processor in there. That chip is way faster than the iPad needs. It always puzzled me a little bit. I think now I understand what Apple was up to. And in fact, that processor in the iPad Pro is the first processor that's going to run Mac OS Big Sur. It's part of the development kit that Apple is kind of renting to developers for $500. They get uh, a number of benefits, including this developer kit, which is essentially an iPad Pro with 16 gigs of RAM and more I.O., more, more capabilities. The iPad Pro really is a full-fledged computer, and this proves it. Apple also stunned us because at the end of their talk last week, they said, oh, and by the way, every Mac OS demo we've done so far has been running on that development kit. And I think that was pretty impressive. It means that, you know, we didn't notice any hesitation or slowness at all. We didn't even know. We thought it was running on a fast Mac. It shows that the stuff that we use day to day on a Macintosh should run just fine on the next generation Apple Silicon chips. I don't even think there's any question that Apple Silicon could even be much faster than the fastest Intel chips out there right now. And that's something that concerns pros. You know, people who just bought a Mac Pro, which is an amazing computer based on Intel's Xeon chip, still x86, uh, probably look with some worry at what Apple's about to do. Can they make the next generation Mac Pro as fast as the current generation? Uh, in my opinion, and in the opinion of a lot of experts, they can. And we have seen chips based on the ARM architecture running at very fast clock speeds. The other advantage these chips have, they're very low power. So Apple could put many more chips in a single computer than before. I wouldn't be at all surprised in a year or two or three to see a Mac Pro that has maybe 64 or even a 128 Mac silicon processors in one box running at three, four, or even five gigahertz. That's a beast. And I think that's the kind of thing we expect. The other thing that happened last week, a couple of days after Apple made the announcement they're moving to Apple Silicon, it was announced that the new fastest supercomputer in the world is running on ARM chips. So I don't think there should be any question that ARM and Apple Silicon have the power. They have the capability. And Apple's going to benefit from not only 10 years of developing these chips, but a very rich ecosystem. Because one of the advantages Apple's going to have with these new Macintosh computers, they'll run almost all, and Apple said this, they dropped it in. I don't think they made a big deal about it, but I think it is a big deal. Almost all the existing iPhone and iPad apps without modification. You'll be able literally on your new Mac, to download an iPad app that you like and run it on the Mac, just as if it were a Mac app. 
That's a big deal because there are millions of apps designed for iPhone and iPad and some very good stuff that hasn't even made it to the Mac. It also is a very big deal for developers because for the first time ever, they can think about developing one application that runs on all three of Apple's platforms. It's a very powerful ecosystem play. So I'm very excited about what Apple's doing. Now, there is some practical consideration. Um, chiefly, should I buy a Mac now or should I wait? If you have a kid going to school in September, if your iMac is just running out of steam, if you dropped your laptop off a pier and you're not going to get it back, yes, of course, you should buy a Mac. Apple said very clearly, we are going to continue to make Intel-based Macintoshes. We have a couple in the pipeline. Probably not a lot. They probably already have them made and they're going to sell them. But they said, more importantly, we're going to continue to sell Intel uh, or support Intel Macintoshes and Intel Mac OS for years to come. Now, that's the exact quote. So you can parse it a little bit. Years could be two years, could be 10 years. <laughs> it's, it's not clear how many. Let me make my prediction. Uh, I believe Apple will ship its first Apple Silicon Macintosh this year. It will likely be a MacBook Pro. Rumors are a 13-inch MacBook Pro. That will be a very exciting machine. And if they get it out in time for your kid going to college, it might be a good choice. It really might. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, then, starting in 2021, throughout the year, I expect Apple will convert their entire line from the MacBook, the MacBook Air, the MacBook Pro, even the iMacs, and possibly even the Mac Pro. That's maybe the one they don't con you know, convert. But every other Mac will be converted to in uh, Apple Silicon in 2021. Apple's saying this transition will take two years. In my opinion, that's, by the way, what they said last time when they were transitioning to Intel. It only took them nine months. In my opinion, that's exactly what they're planning this time. They're thinking, we're going to over uh, under-promise and over-deliver. We're going to say two years. I bet they do 90% of it next year. So this is going to be a very quick transition. One of the reasons... If they drag their feet, then developers drag their feet. And they really want the development community to move to this new form of development based on these new Apple Silicon chips. And I think developers are going to frankly embrace it because they have such a big market available to them with a billion iPhones, hundreds of thousands of iPads, and several million Macintoshes. This is a very attractive market for developers. They want them to move along quickly, so I think they're going to move along quickly. So if you can wait... I probably wouldn't buy a new Mac this year. I'm not going to buy a new computer of any kind this year. It's my guess, my bet, my hunch that next year's Apple Silicon-based Macs will be the best computers ever made. They'll not only be the best Macintoshes, they'll be stunning computers even compared to the x86 architecture. So let's face it, x86 has been around since the 70s. It's probably time to say goodbye. It's an antiquated architecture. I think Apple Silicon is the future, not just for Macs, but for all computing. It's very, very exciting. Uh, so you'll be able to run Windows on them. I suspect they didn't say boot camp, and I think they're saying currently no boot camp plans. So if you run it, you'll be running it in emulation. But these processors should be pretty fast. Remember, Windows is available today on ARM processors. And that's, going back to the very beginning, why it's important to remember these are essentially ARM chips. They're ARM compatibles because you will be able to run Linux and Windows in emulation. They even showed it on these new Macs. So that's important for people. If you can wait, I would wait. If you just bought a Mac Pro, not time to tear your hair out. It's going to take a while before Apple can get a Mac Pro out. I don't think they'll do that next year. They said two years to complete the transition, so that's kind of implying that maybe there'll be a new Mac Pro in 2022. That would be a reasonable time frame. Um, if you've got a Mac Pro now, you still have the fastest Mac made. You probably will for some time to come. For the rest of us, if you can wait, it's worth waiting. Don't feel bad if you have to buy an Intel Mac now. As I said, it'll be supported. But I do have to warn you, and I've been through this before, those PowerPC Macs started to look pretty antique very quickly once Apple moved to An Intel. It didn't take long. The value of those Macs went way down very, very quickly. In fact, Andy Anako just bought one of those beautiful uh, G4 LAMP Macintosh computers for about 84 bucks. <laughs> 
So they don't keep their <laughs> that was pretty old, but they don't keep their value very long. I think it's going to be worth waiting if you can, because this transition to me has a lot of potential. Things can go wrong. It could be a disaster. Absolutely possible. But Apple's a one and a half trillion dollar company with hundreds of billions of dollars in the bank. And they have a huge investment in making this work. And I think they have the skills, the know-how, the desire, all the tools they need. They've been planning this for some time. I think this is going to be a very rapid and a very exciting transition. And as for me, I think it's well worth waiting for. So that's my take on what Apple announced. Next week, we're going to go back into the keyboard system preference pane and show you some other things you may not know your Mac could do. That's next week on Hands on Mac. Hands on Mac brought to you this week, as it often is, by LastPass. You know, your IT department has a big job with more devices, more applications, and now remote workforces, all with new threats and regulations, making strong security extremely complex. Well, LastPass secures every entry point, unifies access and authentication, increases security without impacting productivity, and makes password security effortless. LastPass uses the same encryption type utilized by banks and the military, so you're getting the most security possible. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to find out how they can help you. That's lastpass.com slash twit. I'm super excited. I have not been more excited about the Macintosh since 1984 when it first came out. We are heading into another era. I, to be honest, was very worried that Apple was about to turn its back on the Mac. They were about to make the iPhone and the iPad be their main computing platforms. To me, the changes Apple is about to make prove otherwise. There's no reason for them now. They can have all three, iPhone, iPad, and Macintosh coexisting, living together, and becoming the best ecosystem for computing ever. This is very good news. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you next Friday. Have a happy uh, 4th of July. Leo Laporte for Hands on Mac. Hey folks, it's Micah Sargent here, co-host of Smart Tech Today right here on twit.tv. Every single week, Matthew Casanelli and I sit down to talk about smart tech for the week. That's right. It can get kind of complicated, but there's a lot of news out there. There's a lot of products to dig through. There are a lot of questions to answer, and we try to do that all every single week. From voice assistants to wearables to smart garage door openers and lights, there's so much to cover and, well, so little time. So be sure to check it out. It's twit.tv slash STT. Huh, that rhymes.